The Christ myth theory, at least in its modern incarnation, starts with Paul's reticence about historical details of Jesus. But one thing Paul is not reticent about is that Jesus was crucified. So what may Paul have meant by that and where did he get the idea from? Crucifixion is a punishment with one overriding purpose and that is deterrence. A purpose that is best served by maximising the visibility, severity and duration of suffering of the victim. There are two well-known ancient punishments used for this same purpose of deterrence. One was crucifixion and the other was throwing victims to hungry carnivorous animals in circus performances. The latter was much less frequently done because a suitable circus performance had to be on hand. Understandably, ancient writers were reluctant to go into details about crucifixion and therefore we have limited information about how it was conducted and what we do know mostly comes from the Roman Empire. Its use was fairly widespread and quite variable. There was no standard form of cross and a simple tree, a vertical pole known as a crux simplex, a Latin cross, St Anthony's cross or St Andrew's cross could be used the latter appearing on the flag of Scotland and hence the Union Jack. Victims were generally nailed to the wood, though could occasionally be lashed or tied. In the Roman case, crucifixion was usually preceded by a flogging, but in order to maximise the deterrent effect of the punishment, it was necessary that the victim was not on the point of death when they were raised on the cross, so the spectacle of their suffering could be observed for at least some hours, if not two or three days. The punishment was widely used in the Roman world to punish political sedition, but was largely restricted to slaves, foreigners and enemies, and was not used on Roman citizens. It was very much an earthly rather than a celestial punishment, with abundant earthly precedent, but no celestial precedent at all. Much to the chagrin of mythicists, who, in order to find celestial precedents, have to broaden the category from crucifixion to a passion. Probably the closest celestial example is the death of Inanna or Ishtar, a god who was killed by a blow or a curse and her body was hung on a hook on the wall. Incidentally, she remained dead for three days before being resurrected, but that detail doesn't have a bearing on Paul. So could Paul have got the idea of crucifixion from Inanna? Possible, but it seems to me highly improbable. Paul was, if anything, rather a prude. He strongly disapproved of sexual immorality, but was, I'm bound to say, rather inclined to dwell on it. And he would, no doubt, have strongly disapproved of Inanna's sexual conduct, as she was seductive, promiscuous and manipulative. A Freudian analyst would no doubt have a field day with this, but I find it rather unlikely that Paul would have picked a key element of his salvation story from such a source. Paul mentions the cross or crucifixion 16 times in his genuine epistles. I'll classify the mentions according to his literary purpose. In five cases, he's using the cross or crucifixion to refer to the message of the cross, his overall gospel of salvation, rather than the specific crucifixion part of it. In another five, he's using it as a metaphor for something else, and in six, he's making a direct reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. So looking first at the ones about the message of the cross. There are a couple of things that can be derived from this. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, suggesting that the cross was seen as foolishness by non-believers. The same comment goes for Philippians 3.18, where Paul says many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. These then are the texts where Paul is using crucifixion as a metaphor for something other than the crucifixion of Jesus. Note Colossians 2.14 Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. That suggests that Paul's conception of crucifixion involved being nailed to a cross, but I have been a bit disingenuous because Colossians is not one of the seven genuine epistles of Paul, but one of the three Deuteropauline epistles, those being Colossians, Ephesians and Second Thessalonians. And the authorship of these is disputed, and I'm with the camp, who think that Colossians at least is forged. There is an interesting aside here because this is an illustration of how positions taken by scholars group together into schools of belief. 
This mention of nails in Colossians is highly historicising, and therefore, not surprisingly, mythicists tend to consider Colossians to be non-Pauline. Though I wouldn't go so far as to say that minimal historicists consider it to be Pauline. Anyway, turning now to Paul's comments which are directly about the crucifixion of Jesus, we have another indication of how foolish the crucifixion seems to non-believers in 1 Corinthians 1.23. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Then, 1 Corinthians 2, 8, this is the famous line, None of the rulers of the age understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And this has led to a lot of debate about whether the rulers of this age were temporal rulers on earth or some kind of evil celestial beings. Then Galatians 3, 1, You foolish Gentiles, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. That is a curious turn of phrase. What did Paul mean by portrayed as crucified? Was Jesus really crucified in Jerusalem and portrayed as crucified elsewhere? Or was he only ever portrayed as crucified? Then, Philippians 2.8 And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So he was not found a man, but found in appearance as a man, which is interesting. Further, from this verse, he died on the cross. This is significant because some ancient writers appear to have used the term crucify to refer to a corpse being hung up when already dead, the particular relevance being inana, but this text clearly shows that Paul's concept of crucifixion was somebody dying on the cross. The crucifixion was central to Paul's message, and yet the only references to it are these remarks in passing. Nowhere does he write a paragraph explaining it and its theological importance. Yet he must have had such a narrative in mind, and he presumably had a common understanding with his audience. This observation supports the historicist argument used to counter the silence of Paul from low and high context societies. I go into this in my video on the silence of Paul, but briefly, today we live in a low context society because when we write, we do not assume that our audience has a great deal of background knowledge. We therefore either explain things fully or we cite the work of others or refer readers to where they can find out what's missing. Paul lived in a high-context society because libraries and the internet weren't available, so people's information was that which they knew, and if they knew something, they didn't need it explaining to them. And this, so the argument goes, explains why Paul had so little to say about a historical Jesus. Well, in this case, we can reasonably assume that there was a narrative understood by his audience which he did not describe but referred to in passing, which tends to support the idea of a high-context society and so also supports this counter to the silence of Paul. From what he does say, stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles is claimed as historicising because a celestial crucifixion would not entail worshipping a criminal. Then we've got the concept of crucifixion meaning death on the cross. There is plenty of historical precedence for this kind of punishment, but there is no celestial precedent. That doesn't exclude the possibility that Paul's invention of the celestial crucifixion was influenced by his personal witnessing of earthly crucifixions, but it does make it rather more convoluted. Another question is, does Paul's theology require a punishment that maximises the elements of visibility, intensity and duration of suffering? Current Christian theology doesn't seem to require that at all. If death for our sins was the sacrifice, there was no stipulation that it had to be a particularly gruesome death or particularly spectacular. Paul does use the suffering of Jesus quite a lot though, for example here in Roman 8.17. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And he makes a couple of other similar comments, but the idea that the crucifixion was invented to allow such a comparison with the suffering of Paul and his followers is getting a bit convoluted. Paul's basic scheme here was an all-time sacrifice in lieu of following the law which included annual animal sacrifices. 
How would that requirement lead to crucifixion? Animals were not tortured but were humanely killed in the sacrificial process and their bodies were then burned. There are possible explanations. Witnessing a crucifixion would give enough psychological stress to provoke post-traumatic stress disorder in susceptible persons. Had Paul witnessed one, which he probably did, he may have suffered from this condition. We now know that this condition comes in three forms, acute when it lasts less than three months, chronic when it lasts longer and a delayed onset when it occurs after a period of apparent recovery. The symptoms include intrusive thoughts, flashbacks and nightmares of the traumatic event, all of which would have been interpreted as manifestations of the spirit realm in Paul's time. And PTSD is common, affecting 10-20% to of people who witness life-threatening events. If that happened to Paul, it may also have a role in his theology. The problem is that like so many other similar flights of fantasy, it's just that, with no evidence to anchor it in historical fact. Such speculations aside, it is really quite difficult to understand where Paul got the crucifixion idea from if it wasn't from history. So overall, considering Paul on the crucifixion, we do find a few strikes, but most of them are for historicity. There is the clarification that Paul believed crucifixion was death on a cross, making Inanna precedence less likely. There is the strengthening of the argument from high context society and the observation that Paul's view of crucifixion had plenty of historical precedent, but no celestial precedent we're aware of. Further, we don't have a convincing theory of where Paul got the idea from if it wasn't from history. On the mythicist side is the choice of phrase portrayed as crucified to the Galatians, but then they cannot have witnessed the crucifixion even if it was real. And secondly, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, rather than simply being a man. So, taking these points together, I don't consider the argument to be decisive, but I do consider that as far as Paul on the crucifixion is concerned, the historicists have it.